Hi, I'm Elizabeth Roth. I'm 54 years old. Today is October 9th, 2015, and I'm in Sacramento, California with my very dear old friend, John Meeker. My name is John Meeker. I'm 66 years old. It's October 9th, 2015, and we're in Sacramento, California. And I'm here with Eli Roth, who has been my friend for over 33 years. So, okay, that wipes out the first question, how long have we known each other? Um, <laughs> um, so some of the questions I'm going to ask you are things that we've actually talked about before, but I want to preserve the answers, and they change every time we talk about this. And so the first question you might want to give some thought to, and if you don't want to answer right away, we can come back to it after you've given some thought to it. But it's one of my favorite things to talk about with you. Um, so, if you could spend a day with anybody now living, who would you choose, and what would you want to do with them? Wow. Anybody living. Um, well, that takes out part of my audience. Um, let me give that some thought, and we'll come back to it. Okay. We could, we could start with the broader question. This is the way we usually talk about this. Who would you have at the dinner party? If you could have the dinner party with eight people or whatever, who would you invite to dinner? Well, you would be one. Um, Charlie Rose, um, the head of the Hayden Planetarium. I um, can't remember his name at the moment. He would be one. Um, Feel free to tell me why those people as you list them if you want. Um, Charlie Rose, because he's a very good interviewer um, and a conversationalist. And then uh, also, too, um, the woman on Fresh Air, Terry Gross, um, for the same reasons. And uh, Charlie is, Rose is uh, an attorney um, and has an interesting background and he does good follow-up. Um, other people would would be, um, well, he's, okay, my favorite comedian is gone, so he's not available. Um, we, we can have a dinner for the dead, too. Okay, then Robin Williams, for sure, uh, would be in there. Um, after that, uh, there, um, Nina Totenberg uh, would be one person. Uh, my brother-in-law, Frank, who you know. Right. And then, um, and my sister, both of them would have to be there. Um, uh, I'm at a loss now for others. Um, I, I would have thought you'd have picked some political people. Possibly. Um, there's few and far between, but Michael Bloomberg would be one um, because of his positions. Um, Ralph Nader, who I worked for, I would, would be interesting to have him. He's ironic sense of humor um, on it. After that, um, I'd have to say uh, Bill Clinton would be one. I, I would have expected that. Yeah. Um, on it. But I would also um, possibly another person would be George Will, who I've had dinner with before. And he's a conservative, but he's a principled um, guy, and I, I respect him. After that, um, the uh, the guy that uh, Randy, uh, I think it's Mensch, the guy that wrote, uh, that gave the last lecture. Oh, right. Yeah. Yeah. Him, definitely. Now, so. at the Dinner for the Dead, we've got Robin Williams. Is George Harrison going to get invited to that one? Uh, good point. Uh, yeah, George <laughs> would have to be in there, uh, definitely. <laughs> George and... Uh, yeah, I'm not sure I'd want Eric there, uh, Clapton there, but George Harrison for sure on that. 
Um, yeah. Okay. Yeah, I always expect you to have a smattering of musicians and a smattering of political people and then just interesting people. So you've got a good list going right now. Mm -hmm. I, I know over the years we've talked about this and the list always changes or we put different parameters on it and yeah. categories and it's always been fun to talk about. So you mentioned Ralph Nader and the work you did with him. What what kind of work did you do with him? Um, I got in when I was in an undergraduate at Oregon State. Um, I got involved in organizing the first public interest research group in the country. They were organized both in Oregon and Minnesota about the same time. Um, and public interest research groups are were a way for in the 70s, and this was 1970, 71, and 72. Um, for students to become environmentally and uh, active and involved in uh, projects where students on a statewide basis would uh, assess themselves a dollar per quarter or a dollar fifty semester aggravated, aggr aggregated statewide. And we organized the first group in, in Oregon, as I said, and then that following summer I went back to Connecticut to work on a project for uh, studied the Connecticut Department of Consumer Protection and got involved there and then came back to Oregon, helped, uh, was on the first board of directors and established uh, hiring staff. And then when I left, uh, graduated college, I went to North Carolina and organized, uh, helped organize the one there that um, had a failed effort to get approval. And so I was leading the effort to get that approved, which is ultimately done. And so right now there's public interest research groups in about uh, 20 states, I'm thinking, throughout the country. So it's uh, probably my greatest achievement on a social basis uh, other than graduating law school. Now, how did you get interested in the law? Um, through the, uh, through uh, the public interest research groups, organizing them and seeing what you could do with, with litigation and activism. Um, and my uh, uh, family that I worked for uh, when I was in, uh, growing up was an attorney. Um, so I got to see kind of things that he did. I worked in his law office a little bit. Um, but uh, then when I worked for Ralph and the public interest research groups, I got involved in that again. And then I thought, maybe this is something I could do. So after being out of undergraduate school for I think about three years and working politically on some campaigns, uh, I applied to go to law school. And then after law school, it's been uh, quite a journey. Tell me about that journey. Well, I was fortunate uh, uh, in going to law school. I actually had to get on the waiting list to get in, and I took a gamble and left Portland, Oregon, and came down here before I got accepted, here being Sacramento, and uh, waited to see whether I got admitted. And I did into the night program, and then that was four years going to school, uh, basically almost 10 or 11 months a year. And that was at McGeorge, McGeorge in Sacramento? Yeah, University of the Pacific McGeorge School of Law. And because I started working for some professors on campus, I was able to take extra units. So I graduated with about 20, 25 extra units of law. So I got into a lot of statutory courses, and uh, I worked on an amicus curiae brief the, to the U.S. Supreme Court in... Uh, Yeshiva versus NLRB, and then worked on uh, editing a textbook on public collective bargaining with the same professor that I did the brief with, or edited, and then uh, another book on international trade, uh, and specifically on issues of jurisdiction. Um, so it was it was a real opportunity. I I, I loved law school. I loved law school, too. Yeah. <laughs> Followed in your footsteps and went to McGeorge. Um, so. Oh, I'm going to add one other person okay. to my dinner list. Okay. Keep uh, adding them all through. James Lipton from Inside the Actor's Studio. Oh, yeah, because you love watching the Inside the Actor's Studio interviews. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. So one of my questions was, what are you most proud of having achieved in your life so far? And you mentioned getting the thing set up with Ralph Nader and mm -hmm. Nationwide and all of that. And you qu sort of qualified that as something you're most proud of socially. Yeah. 
what are you most proud of in some other arena? Um, with practicing law, being able to uh, help people and, and uh, being able to uh, help them, guide them through some legal landmines and, and seeing that I had a, made a difference in their lives. Um, and that's, there's cases over the years that have, that have been like that. And um, the, uh, the graduating law school, uh, well, that, uh, was, which was, uh, if I had studied as well in undergraduate school as I did with law school, I would have made more opportunities for, for law school and, and choices. But I took what I had and made the best of it. Yeah. So what, what about personally? Um, you know, like growing up, what were the biggest struggles you had to overcome? Um, the biggest, probably the biggest struggles to overcome was um, after my father died, my mother was, as we've talked about, was an alcoholic. And so the biggest struggle was um, knowing what to do, knowing how to uh, how to become uh, independent on on my own. And by independent, I mean um, not getting ensnarled in that, and not being um, maintaining a boundary away from it. And um, so I started working for other families at, uh, while we were still in Riverside before we moved out of the house to a much smaller place. So I started working for other families on weekends when I was uh, about 11 years old, mowing lawns, painting fences, working for other families like that. So um, that, was, uh, that helped get out of the household and helped me see a different world. Um, And learning to, uh, learning to, uh, I'm trying to figure out how to say this, being in a safer, uh, less chaotic place than being home. How many people were living in your home then? Uh, it changed. Um, I had a sister and a uh, fraternal twin. And so when my dad died when I was nine years old, uh, there was just the three of us, and then we moved two years later into a much smaller house. Lee, my older sister, uh, was the first one to leave when she graduated high school. So by that time, I had just started entering high school. We were in three-year high school. And then my mom shipped my twin brother off to private school because of some behavioral issues and chaos that he was creating. So for a year, that was just she and I. And then... Uh, he moved back in, and we finished up high school together. And then um, he uh, went off to the Marines on a plea bargain, and I went off to college on uh, partial four-year scholarships. And uh, that was the last f full year that I lived in uh, Connecticut, and that was 1968. So do you think experiencing that chaos in your home has helped you later in life? It's helped and hurt both. It's a, it's a dual-edged sword. It helped in the sense that I learned to solve my own problems and to um, figure things out uh, on it. Um, getting out working was made me more socially um, at ease. The downside of it is I learned to make decisions on my own and not to trust and rely on other people. And so I developed some isolating behaviors that uh, later came back to, to bite me. Um, and also to uh, uh, not, not learning how to uh, have friendships because we never had people over at our house. Um, growing up, and so um, it made me uh, adopt some isolated behaviors, which later turned out to be a, a problem. 
But um, the good things were I got into athletics, which also gave me a sense of discipline and um, camaraderie with other people, and I turned out to be fairly decent at it um, in long-distance running and track cross-country. What other sports have you done during your life? Uh, well, I've done uh, long, um, long-range bicycling with my present wife, Sally. Um, we got into all that, so I've done about, uh, I'm going to say, 12 or 15 centuries. So you're riding over 100 miles on a bike in one day. And another 10 or 12, 65 uh, metric centuries, which are about 65 miles. Um, I was a lo- I ran after college for a while, uh, but the most fun thing was jumping out of an airplane, uh, tandem skydive. That she gave me my Sally gave me a present for my uh, 55th birthday, uh, and so I jumped out of a perfectly good airplane and had a ball doing it <laughs> <laughs> on it. So yeah, that was fun. I, that was the same year I did my first century on a bike. So, so one of the things when I think about you and our friendship and everything, I never think in terms of you traveling. Have you done much traveling in your life other than moving for jobs and school? Um, no, I've, um, I've only, my first trip out of the country was a high school student with a couple other buddies and I drove to uh, Canada because one of them was sailing in a small regatta, a small boat in a regatta. And... New York um, State had a driving age which required you to be 18, and I was the only one that was 18 at the time. So we went there. Uh, I've traveled um, both with my first and second wives uh, around the country, uh, but mostly in the United States. Uh, Never been to Europe. I have been to Canada again. I went to Vancouver uh, with my second wife, and uh, had a good time up there, but I have not been to Mexico or Hawaii or uh, South America. So no, that's and that's one of the things I wish we had done more. But that would have been fun, and that wasn't part of my uh, personality at those times. Yeah. So now you're, you know, Sally's retired, and you're. Semi. Probably never going to actually <laughs> retire, but you might start taking more time off. Do you two have plans to do some traveling? Uh, Yosemite is going to be the first place. Um, and then Sally wants to drive back east um, for that. I've traveled cross-country five or six times by car between uh, college and going back east uh, that summer to work. Um and then working in North Carolina and back. Um, So um, it would be fun to be able to go to Europe um, and go to uh, the, uh, I think the Sistine Chapel would be my my first stop. Why Uh, the Sistine Chapel? I'm told it's stunningly beautiful inside and uh, the paintings by Michelangelo. do that and be to Ven- go to Venice and then uh, maybe Ireland, but uh, definitely Italy uh, would, be, would be the first stop. So right now, I know you haven't been doing much bicycling because you've just recently had surgery, but what are your favorite things to do other than work? I know work is your favorite thing to do. Yeah, it's getting to be less so, but um, I like uh, I like being down in the ocean. I like being closer to the water. Um, the biking was uh, was fun because it, you could do it with Sally, but it also helped uh, was a good counteract uh, counteraction for depression. Uh, so. It, I'd get those great little yahoos running through my body once you start going on a long ride. Um, other than uh, the traveling, um, I enjoy I enjoy the riding, but doing together it would be the traveling with Sally. 
Did you do much traveling with Trisha, your first wife, or Diane, your second wife, other than what you've already talked about? Um, no, those were the only trips. That traveled more with Diane. We took the vacation in, in uh, uh, Vancouver, and then another time we vacationed in uh, Chicago, which is one of my favorite big towns. Yeah, Chicago's a great place. Yeah, yeah, I love Chicago. I, it's in the... It's an even match for New York, but the energy level in New York is quite different. Um, but those were the only two trips. I traveled to Florida for a friend's wedding, a client that invited me to his wedding. And um, then I've been, um, oh, I did have one other trip as a college student. Um, I fought forest fires and made enough money that I could go back to Connecticut early for uh finish the summer and so I hooked a ride with a friend of mine on a uh, small private plane and it was free but it was also his first long distance solo as a pilot that was brave <laughs> uh, yeah it got even more interesting over Dallas because we um, had trouble finding the airport in the, about 4 o'clock in the afternoon and we finally found it with the help of Dallas Control and then as we were landing I'd been in a private plane a couple of times before and turned out uh, Bob, the pilot, came a little bit far, too far down the runway, and we had to do a touch and go uh, over uh, down the runway. So I still can visualize the Dodge convertible with a top down and the blue with white interior in the Dodge dealership that, was, that we flew over as we cleared it. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> and the panicked salesman looking up. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, I didn't notice... That person, I, I've always liked cars, so I was focused on the cars first. <laughs> so we made it all the way around uh, and touched down. Not a word was said from the moment he decided to go. Came all the way around and uh, came to the tie down. And uh, he apologized and said, Bob, we're in one piece. We're good. It's, it's, it's done. But his uh, friend that was meeting us, uh, I'm not sure he'd seen it because he came up walking up to us and yeah, he, uh, he had this orange sweatshirt on with the sleeves cut off. Um, Bob was a graduate student, and this guy was a friend of his. And it had the unit, the logo, and it had the words "the university." And I was still not focused, so I asked him, "Well, what's the university?" And he puffed up his chest, and I said, "Well, in a pompous way, well, that's the University of Texas." And I, my filter wasn't on at that point. And I said, "That's right. You guys got to." You guys got a football team, if I remember right, which they were like in the top five nationwide that year. And he, well, of course we got a football team. I said, yeah, I remember you somewhere in the top 40. And Bob stepped in and said, you know, his friend was getting a little irate. And I said, he said, you just didn't see what we went through. And he said, no. And he said, we just had to touch and go. And the guy goes, oh, okay. Understood. <laughs> <laughs> so... Uh, one of the few times my filter didn't did, wasn't in place. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, usually you have your filter on quite well. Yeah. Um, so, trip to the Sistine Chapel sounds good. If you were writing your bucket list, what else would be on it? Um, either go to uh, Nepal. Uh, yeah, go to Nepal more than... Uh, Machu Picchu, um, for a long hike. Um, and um, Denmark. Um, my brother had a Fulbright. And I'd like to, like to see what he saw. Um, I, I, by my father... We were the sons of uh, my father's second marriage. My first, uh, his first marriage, he had a, a son and two daughters, and his son went on to become an architect, and um, he became polit politically active. Uh, he was in the Republican Party, but he was that rare breed of moderate Republicans, um, and he worked with uh, former Senator Luger when he was uh, mayor of Indianapolis, and then uh, then went on to become uh, Deputy Secretary of Housing and Urban Development in the Nixon administration and developed the block grant program. Uh, by that 
time when he was in Washington, I was in North Carolina, so I got to spend some time with him. And uh, he has the same sense of humor, similar sense of humor that I do. And so although we were in different parties, we could joke real well together. And he once told me um, that, I can't remember what we were talking, but uh, the comment came up about, um, you know, with him being busy, he said, well, hair doesn't grow on a busy street, to which I immediately responded to, I'm not familiar with putting my head on the street for people to run over it. So, <laughs> <laughs> so we, in our family with humor, there, in our family, there, there was a quick and the dead. <laughs> so it, uh, I would like to go to Denmark because I can remember, I think uh, in Amsterdam, there is the statue of the mermaid on the rock. Yes. But I'd like to see. I think. Copen okay, yeah. I think it's in Copenhagen. Yeah. Um, yeah. So those would be the first two places, three places to start out with um, on it, yeah. Um, other than uh, Nepal and Asia, I'm not sure I'd go to anywhere else um, on that, but definitely uh, Italy, uh, maybe Germany, yeah, Germany. I, I need to take a car out on the uh, Autobahn. I need to be able to shift in fifth gear at 140. I could see you doing that. <laughs> I could totally see you enjoying a day on the Autobahn. Yeah. yeah. Get out of the way! <laughs> flash the lights. But... <laughs> oh, yeah. Because you, you've, you've taken some driving yes, classes. I'm... I've been to autocross school with in uh, Porsches with my first wife, and so I've done that. I've conquered a Porsche with her uh, in the uh, Porsche parade uh, that comes switch coats every year, and then uh, I, I never turned down an opportunity to uh, drive a uh, a car that I wanted to. So I've done a Maserati Quadratrope, uh, Porsche 911 uh, quad. Um, and uh, uh, autocross school was another 911 turbo. So, yeah, uh, I love fast driving. Uh, I haven't gotten a speeding ticket, uh, although I've been upwards of a 110 or 120 on, on the freeway. So it was a rush. So what's your dream car? Uh with no regard to credit line, I would have to. I'd have to test several cars first. Well, but, of course. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, BMW M5, uh, a Porsche 11, Porsche 911, um, Carrera, a um, Infiniti G38. Oh, and an Acura. Um, uh, the two-seater sports car, the uh, DX, or I'm not sure the name, but, you know, mid-engine sports car. And that, that would definitely be one. You're not going to get a Tesla or something ecologically sound? I'd get a Tesla just because I've heard it's got some awesome power. I'd, um, it only makes, they've just recently come out with a coupe, so uh, I, I'd give it a try, but I'd have to have it on a someplace where I could test the suspension on it. I hear it's got some awesome power on. They've got a very modified version now that you can break wheels loose. Really? Yeah. Okay. Right. So back to that first question, who could you spend a day with? Has all this talking made you think of somebody? One person, huh? Just one person. This is your bucket list day. You know, you want to spend... a a day with someone? Um, well, in that case, it'd be the Dalai Lama. Okay. Yeah. And what do you, you guys can go anywhere you want. Where are you going to go with him? What are you going to do with the Dalai Lama? I would ask him to take me to a place that means the most to him and ask him why. Oh, that'd be great. That'd be really great. Yeah. Um, definitely with him. Uh, um, yeah. 
put my put myself in his hands. So the Dalai Lama and the Sistine Chapel makes it seem like you're very spiritual or religious, and yet I would never describe you as religious. There's a difference between spirituality and, and uh, religious. Spiritual I am. Um, religious connotes to me more of a structured and doctrinaire um, type of approach to w what's going on in the world. And uh, as we've been seeing lately, uh, that can get out of hand. Um, I choose to do it on a more individual basis and to um, uh, and a, on a personal basis with somebody um, than uh, a denomination or anything like that. So yeah, there is a there's a Grand Canyon difference between those two. On that. Well, have you been to the Grand Canyon? As a matter of fact, I have. <laughs> I've, uh, we went with uh, went with Diane, and we were in a helicopter. We did the Grand Canyon. We didn't walk down it, but uh, and it was before they built the uh, plexiglass ledge over it. Oh yeah, the big observation deck. Yeah, yeah. That seems pretty um, intrusive, even though it's you know into the, the natural surroundings. But it is a little. Um, sensational, but I'm not afraid of heights, and walking out on a plexiglass and looking down would be uh, something you would never forget. That's Yes. <laughs> would be a good trip. Yeah. Uh, you've never had children of your own. You've had stepchildren. Mm -hmm. um, is that something you regret, or was that a conscious decision on your part? Uh, I'm going to say it was semi-conscious at the time it was made. Trisha, my first wife, had had kids by two prior marriages, and um, she was a potential uh, candidate for breast cancer. So at that time, I agreed to a vasectomy, and this was in 1979 or 1980. Um, and the reason I say semi-conscious is I'm not sure I gave it, gave it enough uh, thought, um, but it, it was something that uh, put her more at ease and, and made her happy. Um, but it also assumed that we were going to be together, uh, married for a long time, and uh, we weren't. And it also was at a time when um, I'm not sure I wanted to pass on uh, genes uh, that I had uh, to someone else, given the family dynamics. Um, I've been told I've been a good uh, step-parent, and uh, I've got a good, <clears throat> excuse me, good relationship with... Sally's two boys that we were, when we were married, um, they were 15 and 18, and more than one of my friends asked, what the hell are you doing? Because they had not had a, a father figure in the house since their father walked out on them when the youngest was three months old and the other boy was about two and a half. So it's, uh, there's a lot of lessons to be learned from, from kids and, uh, the closest I've seen to kids being born was with with uh, Evelyn. Yeah, that's my daughter. Right. Um, I saw Evelyn a couple of days after she was born. I think it was the next day. Okay. I can't imagine that it was much longer than that. Yeah. So, yeah, there are some regrets there, but um, I'm not about to be able to undo it. I did look into reversing the vasectomy, but it was... Uh, elective surgery and was very expensive and couldn't do it at the time and um, Diane surprised me after we were married saying that um, she didn't want kids and she was afraid of having them so by the time I married Sally it was t 20 years later and the odds of reversing that and she didn't want kids so here we are <laughs> <laughs> well you've been a good influence in Evelyn's life have I? and I have seen that you're a good step-parent to Sally's boys. Thank you. Um, so we've talked about people you want to meet and places you want to go. What if you could travel through time? Where would you go and what would you want to see? Or who would you want to meet or, you know, you get one one trip. It's a, it's a one-shot time travel 
Well, that's a tough question. Um, but I'd go back to me, to uh, me, my, spend some time with my father. He, uh, as, as you know, he died suddenly at a time when uh, he was coming back from a uh, medical convention. And uh, when he got back, we were supposed to go out to, uh, from Connecticut to Michigan and go out hunting with him and uh, spend some time with getting to know each other again. Um, and uh, we never did that. So I would like to learn more about him. His father died when he was a young lad, nine or ten or so. Um, he went on to be a, a, a medical doctor, um, undergraduate in chemical engineering, and then uh, a doctor. And um, he had, a, I think he had a real zest for life, but he had some some ghosts too. It would be good, interesting to go back and share those. Um, as you know, I, uh, he died of a heart attack. I had a heart attack. Uh, in 2009, but fortunately I was in the ICU waiting for a stent to be put in. So I got past that, and uh, I've just had the cancer surgery, so uh, I beat those duos, and uh, one of my big um, things to figure out from here on is where do I go from here, and how do I do it differently? You don't often get... Uh, Two additional shots at the apple. Yeah. Yeah, I remember when you were the age that your dad was when he died, and you marked that as a very significant age for you to get past. Mm -hmm. And I know you had a lot of fear kind of coming up on that. Yeah, uh, I'd been monitoring my heart uh, condition since my 40s. And as you know, Neither of my parents lived. My dad died at 58, my mother at 62. So I beat them and I'm uh, uh, the oldest, well not the oldest, but the oldest surviving male in our, our line. So yeah. And uh, like Jackson Brown said, it's uh, starting to run on empty. <laughs> you don't strike me as running on empty. Yeah. You seem like you're gonna take good advantage of and opportunities that are still there for you. Well, it's both a gift and in some ways I feel uh, a burden. What do I do with this time that I've got left? So what are you thinking of doing with it? I'm still sorting that out, but I've got to, I want to give back in some way and uh, I want to do it in a different way than using my legal skills. Um, I, want to, I want to touch new experiences in doing that. Um, make connections. So I'm doing some reading now on, on some avenues, and as soon as I bounce back from this surgery, I'm going to start to explore those. Mm. So you want to have some sort of a legacy? Uh, I'm, well, the legacy gets created whether you want it or not. Uh, it's how you look back on it. And uh, yeah, I do. Uh, uh, the, the legacy is for me and how I feel about what I've done. And I'll let other people uh, evaluate on their own. Okay. Well, when they evaluate, somebody someday may create a museum display celebrating your life. What do you think will be in it? Wow. Um, it'll... Uh, some sports memorabilia from high school, um, uh, some of my writings, and more photographs. I don't have enough photographs of me, and part of that was self-concept involved, but uh, more, uh, more photographs and got to have music. Uh, the theme will be my back pages from Bob Dylan's 30th anniversary reunion concert at Madison Square Garden. That's right. <laughs> Well, thank you for doing this. Thank you for your thoughts and putting this together. It's been fun. It has.
and may the long and winding road continue. And may the wind ever be at my back. <laughs> yes. <laughs>